I don't even know if I can speak after hearing after that song. It's every time I hear that song, I, it, it it just really. I don't know. I think sometimes I relate a lot to Thomas. You know, uh, I can I can see the struggle, and I loved in that video when he said, "I didn't know if I was able or willing to trust again." Death has a way of doing that. Death is the one thing that we probably fear the most besides public speaking. So this is your worst fear on public speaking about death. Um, Because death is an unraveling of order, isn't it? I mean, we talk about beauty as proximity and beauty as order and the sort of proper relationship between parts and people and, and God and one another and God within his own community. And everything we see when we look at creation was God taking from this darkness, right? From the Tehom. He was, he was taking it and he was bringing it into an order. And then he proclaimed it as beautiful, right? As it was woven together. It became something generative, it gave possibility. And death seems the exact opposite of that. It's taking that beautiful order, that, that woven tapestry, and pulling and tearing at the edges to get them to fray and grabbing some threads and unraveling the whole thing. And it's such a chaotic moment, it's such a difficult situation to even know what to do with that uh, you know it evokes all kinds of emotions of grief and struggle and this is what the disciples were experiencing as we get to John chapter 20 all the complexity all of the heartache all of the grief that comes with the reality of death from the one that you're most nearest to What do you do with that? We have a hard time with that, don't we? We never seem to quite heal. It always leaves a scar. And so we get to chapter 20, and we see that we've gotten to the first day of the week on Sunday. And Mary Magdalene, along with other Women came early to the tomb. If you want to turn to John 20 and read with me. While it was still dark and saw that the stone had already been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, which we know as John, the writer of this gospel, and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. How insulting it must have felt for Mary the very fact that here you have Roman guards that are supposed to be guarding the tomb. They are the only ones that can set the seal and they're the only ones that are supposed to be able to be able to remove it. And it's quite the, the stone. It, take, it would take a team of people to do that. And after the scandal of the murder of Jesus upon the cross by the hands of Rome, now coming to just visit his gravesite and see it disturbed. That must have been painful. And she didn't know what else to do, so she ran to Peter and John. So Peter and the other disciple went forth, and they were going to the tomb. And the two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrapping lying there, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb And he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the face cloth with which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered. I want you to listen to what he says here. And he saw and he believed. Now we don't know what Peter was thinking. We just know that Peter, as rambunctious as he always is, enters the tomb first after after Mary had seen it. 
And you have three very different experiences looking at this empty tomb. You have Mary, who, and, and probably the other women, though they're not stated here, but in the other Gospels they are, who see the tomb and feel like it's a scandal. Something has happened, right? Someone's moved Jesus. Someone has disturbed the tomb. Peter, who runs in, and oddly enough, the one who is always the first to make the boldest statements in a great sense of irony here is silent. And then you have John who goes into the empty tomb after Peter and it says he believed. I want to let you just sort of sit with a question for a moment. When you look at the empty tomb, what do you see? I want you to, to use your mind's eye, to, to use some imagination here, to think about if you're looking at the empty tomb. Because this isn't just a question. This isn't just an experience that they had then. It's an experience that we all have when we're presented with the reality of the empty tomb. We have to answer, what does it mean? So what do you see when you look into the empty tomb? Do you see just one more scandal? Just one more example of the empire squelching any opposition and now here uh, distorting and disrupting even the, the disruptor in his own rest. Do you look into the tomb and are you skeptical? Say, well, you know, Jesus did talk about, the Gospels give witness to, He talked about that He was going to raise on the third day. Surely He had gathered quite a following among the early disciples. And so it's highly likely that a team of them went into the night. Uh, maybe they deposed the centurions in some way. Maybe they took a small group of people and deposed them. Uh, rolled away the stone and took Jesus' body and disposed of it somewhere so that the legend would live on. That's a pretty common viewpoint <laughs> floating around out there. You look at the empty tomb and just say, I don't know what to make of it. I've never seen anything like that. I've never known. I want to believe but it just, I've been reared and nursed at the side of scientific uh, empiricism, and that's just not scientific. So I want to believe, but, you know, I just, you can't, you can't test that in a, in a classroom lab. Or do you go in with John and see the empty tomb and say, from the core of my inner being, I believe. I believe. The empty tomb is probably one of the most scandalous qualities of the Gospels in the early church in the, the first and second century. Because no one knew what to do with it. It was unlike anything they had ever seen or heard or witnessed to before. So we have four Gospels, right? I mean, everyone's trying to give witness to what happened because it was so unlike anything that was common to reality and experience. It wasn't like, yeah, I mean, we read about Lazarus, say, oh, well, people were coming back from dead all the time. This was just a normal occurrence for them. This was not. When's the last time you saw someone come back from the dead? Probably the last time they saw one too. Unless you're Lazarus's family. And so, verse 9, we pick back up and it says, For as yet they did not understand the Scripture, that He must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head 
and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Does anyone else see that how odd that question is or must have felt for her? Like, what do you mean why am I weeping? My Lord just died. My best friend just died in the most gruesome and graphic of ways. Oh, what do you mean why am I weeping? So she said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. More than any of the others, she was just upset that someone would have the audacity to disturb her Lord's rest. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? That's a very jesus thing to say, isn't it? What do you seek? Right? Where he always, he asks you that, what are you seeking? You're in for a new journey. Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbanai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and sisters and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, and my God, and your God. There's a lot happening here, and I just want to draw out a couple things. Um, Mary here has this real encounter with the risen Jesus. And you can understand why she was perplexed when she first saw him, why she couldn't understand, and uh, until she heard Jesus say her name, and she's like, that's... Jesus, I, I know that's him. And he, he told her not to cling to him because he was still going to be with them a little longer. As he had mentioned to them, he, he told them back in John 14, 15, 16, in the farewell discourse, I am not going to leave you as orphans. A little while and you will no longer see me. And then a little while you will see me. And then he tells them it's, for your good that I leave. Because if I do not leave, I cannot give you the spirit, the advocate, the helper, the counselor, the paraclete to come in and abide in you, right? to guide you, not only to walk with you as Jesus in the flesh did, but to walk with you from within. And so here Jesus is saying, don't cling to me, but let them know that I'm back. And, it's, and the other thing, really, that I want to pull out of verse 17, it says, I ascend to my Father and your Father, and my God and your God. Sometimes when we're reading a Bible story, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, we, we think the story is about the person that we're reading about. We think it's about Moses. We think it's about Peter. We think it's about... James, or whoever else it is we're reading about, but it, that's not the case. It's always about God. Every scripture that you read, Old Testament, New Testament, like, is about who God is, how God relates to his creation, and how his creation responds back to him. Every passage you've ever read, that's what it's about. And sometimes when we read this story, we, we kind of want to make it about some of the individual characters. And certainly, they have an important part that we're going to get to in just a moment. But the central part is this is about God. This is about what He is doing. And what's interesting is what we began in John, in John 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Nothing was created except through the Word. And that Word became flesh and made pitched His tent among us. And so the eternal pre-existing Son in the form of Word or Logos came and was in flesh and lived as one of us. He had never lived in that state prior to that. God was doing something new in the history of the world. And right here, 
He's saying he's doing something new again. Because it's not as if, okay, Jesus' work is done, now he's going to be disincarnated and go back to be Logos. No, that's not what he says. It's not what he does. He ascends in the incarnate form. And this is significant because here he says, I'm going to your Father and my Father, to my God and your God. Because he is eternally in the form of you and I. He's eternally one of us with this dual nature, fully God, fully person. The ancient Christians call that the hypostatic union. He's eternally in that form and that allows us the ability to have an intimacy with him as well. He became, one of the early church fathers said that he became one of us so that we can become one of his. He became like us so that we could become like him. And so in this form here, Jesus is saying, don't cling to me. Let them know that I'm about to ascend and it's going to change everything. How poetic this is. And Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, why were they afraid of the Jews? We're not told in the text, but I'd fair to say it's because they didn't actually believe what she told them. You see what John's doing is he's inviting us into that. Where are we in this whole picture? Is it enough for us to believe upon the proclamation that He is living and that He is moving and that He is near to each of us? That He is alive again? Because Mary Magdalene saw through the eyes of faith. John saw through the eyes of faith. But it seems clear that the disciples were still unpersuaded. And so Jesus came, the, the doors were locked, they were shut. And then Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. This is a pretty common greeting in the early, uh, the early church. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side, and the disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you as the Father has sent me. Oh, I'm sorry. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. So here they are in this gathering. They're afraid. They're probably praying. They're probably like, what are we going to do next? What is going on? They're, the pressure is coming upon us. The persecution is increasing. Uh, you know, they killed Jesus because they thought, well, if we eradicate the leader, we can eradicate the movement. So Jesus is out of the picture. Now they're going to start pinpointing the other leaders, and that's what they do. We know that from, from history. And then Jesus sort of gives them their commission here. Maybe we hadn't thought about it like that before. But he says, I'm sending you. As the Father has sent me, I came from the Father to become you. I'm sending you in the exact same way. Go. Bear witness about me to others. Let them know that I am real. And then he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And, and uh, this is it's pretty interesting and an obscure passage, but uh, most likely he is preparing them for the reception of the Spirit that's going to come on the day of Pentecost. And then verse 23, if you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Well, what does that mean? 
Does that mean as the church we can just kind of dictate anything we want to? Oh, that's not a sin anymore. You can do that. That's fine. Oh, no, I don't like you doing that. I'm going to call that a sin, and now you can't do that because I don't like it. You see how this could go awry and south. This is not what Jesus, the intention of what Jesus was saying at all. Though we kind of practice it that way, don't we? We might not in, we might not come forthrightly and say it, but if I don't like it, it's a sin. <laughs> but how dare you, you know, call me out? And uh, that's not that's not what Jesus is talking about at all. I love there's a description here. One writer describes it like this. He he combines this with what we looked at in John thirteen thirty four through thirty five when Jesus says, "How will you be known as my disciple?" How are we known as his disciples? Love one another. Right? That is the fundamental, fundamentally most important way that we are a witness to the broader watching world is how we treat and love each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so he says there's a connection here. It says if you see this with Jesus' commandment to love one another in 13, 34 through 35, a possible picture of the church's mission emerges. By loving one another as Jesus loves, the faith community reveals God to the world. By revealing God to the world, the church makes it possible for the world to choose to enter into a relationship with this God of limitless love. It is in choosing or rejecting this relationship with God that sins are forgiven or retained. The faith community's mission, therefore, is not to be the arbiter of right or wrong, but to bear unceasing witness to the love of God in Jesus. So it's not our job to be the arbitrator of what is a sin and what is not. That's God's job. And God's defined that. And God's given us revelation of that. It's our job to bear witness of love for one another. And in so doing, we present people with the opportunity to make a decision. But again... That all comes down to this one word of belief. So, not only did the disciples maybe lack belief, but then we see Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, this is verse 24, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord, but he said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. I will not believe. It's interesting that there are seven, John talks about seven signs in the book of John. But there's actually an eighth. And that's the resurrection. There's eight signs in the book of John. The resurrection being the last. Interestingly enough, here in verse 26, after eight days, his disciples were again inside. And Thomas was with them. And Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands. And reach here in your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believe. He didn't rebuke him, did he? See, the story's not actually about Thomas at all. About Jesus. Jesus sees your worries. Jesus sees your doubts. Jesus sees your struggles. Jesus knows the the chaos that can sometimes consume our hearts and our minds. How complex life can seem. Jesus sees it all. And he comes into that and says, See me and believe. Because in that belief, not only is the power of the resurrection over death and all that ails us, right? All the unraveling that death does is stopped and reversed through the resurrection of Jesus. And we await the fullness of that that is yet to come. What does resurrection offer for us right now? Lots of possibilities. How little of that seems to be in our currency today. Life can often seem like dull drudgery. 
can be feeling constantly within the ebbs and flows of pain and suffering, constantly in the grips of grief, living in a Friday world, in a Saturday world, where all we can see is the loss of hope and the absence of God. And resurrection Sunday, it shows us something different. If you recall in the past, I told you that the early Christians called Sunday not only the first day of the week, they called it the eighth day. Eight signs in the book of John, eight days after his death, he's meeting them on the first day of the week, which they also considered the eighth day. The day that is without compare, the day that we are still awaiting here, Jesus is with them and says, when you believe in me, you see and live with the powerful reality of possibility that even the darkest, deepest hurts and woes that you can experience do not strip your possibility of hope and future in life. The deepest pains that you feel and the deepest marks that sin can put in your life do not stack up against the power of the possibility made real through the resurrection. I love how Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 15. Oh, death, where is your victory? Right? Oh, death, where is your sting? And he's talking about the resurrection. And I love Thomas's proclamation here. Thomas answered him and said, my Lord and my God. When you look at the empty tomb, can you make that proclamation? Can you say, my Lord and my God, I see you, I know you, and I am here with you. My Lord and my God, I see the empty tomb, and I'm not going to lapse into cynicism, but I'm going to see the gift of possibility. My Lord and my God, you are all I need. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. Who is he talking to? He's talking to us. He's talking to us. For whatever gain Thomas had in that moment of recognition of Jesus, whatever gift that was, we are even more filled and blessed because we choose to live. See, John talks a lot about belief. The whole book of John is about belief. Sorry, Braylon was playing that out. So. The, the whole book of John is about belief. But who is the book of John written to? Not unbelievers. Randy Harris made this point. And it struck me, and I've been ruminating on it for a week. The book of John was not written to unbelievers. It was written to the church. He's not calling. It's not an overtly evangelistic book. He's called the church to believe. We say it. We proclaim it. As Dr. Colvin so eloquently stated, we put the stickers on our vehicle. We have the t-shirts. Do we believe? Do you believe? He says, blessed are you who did not let the fool do that, but still choose in the face of all aridity, in the face of all desperation, in the face of all despair, to say, my Lord, and my God. How provocative that statement was for Thomas for this fledgling movement of just a few people embarking on a very scary journey. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you, church, 
they believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The narrative that guides almost every secular enterprise in our society is that it's death that is the moving factor, right? Natural selection. It's death that guides it forward. It's the scarcity 